Yeah. Okay, great. Well, uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks very much for uh, the invitation to come and speak here. Uh, I've got quite a lot to get through, got quite a lot to get through in a relatively short time, so I'm going to crack straight on. Um, uh, this is the overview of what I want to talk about today. Uh, first, a quick look back at the definition of integrated pest management, uh, and then some results of work that we've been doing investigating spray application on commercial horticultural farms. And then I'm going to talk uh, briefly about some of the technical aspects <coughs> of developing a variable rate spray machine for, uh, for apple orchards. And then finally, uh, some of the barriers I think that there are on the uptake of these approaches. So I wanted to start the presentation with this slide, uh, largely to remind myself of what is meant by integrated pest management. Um, as to be honest, it's been a little while since I've sat down and thought about the definition of IPM and what it means in today's agriculture and horticulture. So this slide here is, the, is uh, copied and pasted out of the FAO website uh, and their definition of IPM. I've highlighted the parts that I think are particularly relevant to what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so it talks about combining different man management strategies, it talks about minimising the use of pesticides, analysing the agro ecosystem, so i.e. The, the cropped land and all that is within it. Uh, it talks about using monitoring and diagnostic systems, the management of natural enemies with the minimum use of pesticides, which should, which should be applied only when needed. But I would argue that there is a very important word missing here, which is where. So as we've already heard today, pests and diseases in a crop are rarely homogeneously dispersed throughout that crop. They're almost always unevenly dispersed, both in time and space. Therefore, to minimize pesticide usage and improve production efficiency, we must encourage and provide the tools to growers to target their control measures correctly and move away from uniform blanket spraying. So how can we approach the where part? Um, there are several methods to get the active substance, whether it be a synthetic chemical or a repellent or a pathogenic fungi or predatory insect onto the target pest. Um, most of the growers I've met are sensible people and I think on the whole don't spray when they don't need to. But I think that the biggest contributor to overuse of pesticides is inefficient application. And I'm gonna talk in more detail about optimizing and targeting spraying um, in the remainder of this talk. I think it's also worth mentioning, although I'm not going to talk about it uh, uh, later on, but it's also worth mentioning that um, we don't always need to take the active ingredient to the pest. Sometimes we can bring the pest to the active. And I think this method is extremely underutilized by the industry at the moment, but it has huge potential in reducing overall application of pesticides. You can't improve what you don't measure. Well, I've, I've borrowed that quote from, I think, business management, um, but I think it's quite applicable in crop protection as well uh, and, in, and in spray application. So over the past few years, we've been involved in developing a tool for measuring spray deposition quickly and easily and directly on crop surfaces. So we've used this device, um, which is a handheld imaging fluorimeter, to look at spray deposition on a wide variety of crops uh, in a wide range of situations. So you can see here on this uh, graph on the right, uh, the results of measuring spray deposition on a broccoli crop, uh, which was in Spain. Um, the basic problem with spraying any pest or disease control products onto a crop is that the more exposed areas of a plant receive many times more active ingredient than the sheltered areas of the plant. Therefore, to achieve sufficient spray deposition on the hard to reach places, we must hugely overspray the easy to reach places. Um, this is really not a simple problem to tackle. The, and the transition towards contact acting pesticides rather than systemic products makes the issue even more important. So in this next example, you can see the results of an assessment of spray deposition on a crop of tabletop strawberries. So these were sprayed at a thousand litres per hectare, which is extremely high, I would say, for uh, this kind of crop, or at least at the top end. 
Um, so this particular farm had a new, uh, in their words, top of the range modified spray machine with uh, drop legs to improve application. However, the crop was suffering from extremely high mildew levels uh, and this was resulting in significant yield loss, even with multiple applications of fungicide. So the grower was suspecting that the pathogen had developed resistance to the fungicides being applied. We, uh, from uh, NIA BMR, we came in and uh, assessed the spray deposition on the crop and found that the deposition on the leaves inside the canopy near the crown of the plant, so that, that deep down in the center of the plant, uh, the deposition was extremely poor, particularly on the underside of the leaves. So uh, by thinning the canopy, removing two to three leaves from the top of the plant, the spray was able to penetrate much better into the crop. And in fact, almost tripling the spray coverage at that part of the, of the canopy from around 10% up to about 30% of those leaves near the crown. And within four weeks, the mildew was uh, under control. So there was no resistance to the fungicides. It was only down to poor spray deposition into the crop. So while this sounds like a, a really great result, um, the analysis shows though that the spray deposition coverage was still around five to seven times lower on the underside of the leaves compared to the upper leaf surfaces. And this is common on many crops that I've looked at, particularly those with uh, larger leaves. So in this particular crop, the spray deposition coverage on the underside of the leaves down in the lower parts of the canopy near the crown of the plant averaged less than 5%. Uh, and even worse than that is that although the mean coverage was 5% overall, the number of leaves with zero coverage on was, quite, was still very high. So first let's have a look at what leaf surfaces actually look like either either with 3.1 percent spray coverage over here on the left image um, compare this to the leaf leaf image on the right with 32.3 percent spray coverage so not only is the cover the absolute coverage important we also need to think about the distribution of the spray so we don't want to see large gaps between spray deposits so i think these two images just show um, quite clearly that if we leave large areas of the crop with very, sprawl, very poor spray coverage, for example, less than 5%, we're leaving the crop open to attack from pathogens and pests. So next, this graph on the right over here, um, yeah, sorry, so this graph on the right over here shows the percentage of leaves within that crop that have less than 5% spray coverage on. And you can see that down again near the crown on the underside of the leaves, it's not far off 100% of those leaves, it's something it's 90 something percent of those leaves have uh, less than 5% spray coverage on. We need to consider that initial mildew infection starts down near the crown where there's almost no fungicide hitting on the underside of those leaves. So can you imagine the potential reduction in pesticides if we could get adequate spray down onto the right part of the crop, controlling the pathogen before it even becomes a major problem? And there are other pests and diseases that uh, start the infection down at that part of the plant of tarsinibid mites, for example. So moving on to another example, spotted wing Drosophila, SWD. It's one of the most, uh, well, one of the soft fruit industry's most economically important pests. The insect prefers humid areas out of direct sunlight and can often be found in the lower, lower down parts of the crop and inside the canopy. In addition, in crops like cane fruits, uh, the fruits lower down can be missed by pickers, making this, uh, this part of the crop even more attractive for egg laying SWD. So the results shown here on this graph on the right um, are from trials that we did on a commercial farm to assess the spray deposition with different, different spray settings. So here you can see the deposition achieved when the air resistance fan was reduced to half its normal RPM. 
And you can see that the reduced fan speed improved the spray distribution throughout the canopy, giving a significant increase to deposition in the middle, bottom, and the inner parts of the canopy, which is precisely where the SWD prefers to hang out. So this is an example of um, how simple and cheaply growers can improve their spray deposition and get more out of the sprays that they're doing. Um, I would say as a rule of thumb, and this is very much a, a rough, rough rule of thumb, spray deposition coverage should be between 20 and 40 percent. But really, it would be useful to have more information on the effective dose for particular products controlling specific pests. I think this information has got to come from the uh, manufacturers of the products. Uh, it's also worth noting that things like two spotted spider mite tends to colonize the bottoms of hot plants and raspberry canes. So this type of optimization of the spray machines could also improve, improve control of mites. So what are the options for growers with current technologies and spray equipment? Uh, they can measure the spray deposition in the crop and alter the settings, optimizing the spray machines throughout the growing season to reduce overall applications of pesticides, ensuring products are being applied not only when, but also where they are needed to get the maximum effect of the active ingredient. To do this, growers need, need more information. First, information on what good spray deposition for the product target and crop is. And second, they need tools to measure the spray deposition on their crop. There are a variety of methods that they can do this with, such as, wa such as water sensitive papers, coloured dyes, or a handheld imaging perimeter. So of course, crop canopy is hugely variable, and even fairly small changes to the crop canopy can affect spray deposition. So whilst many product labels do contain crop and pest specific information with guidance on concentration and water volumes. Um, there are often comments like ensure good penetration of the foliage. But what does that actually mean? What do they mean by good? I've seen quite a few spray machines on farms which are set up when they're first purchased and then uh, rarely altered again. However, spray settings should be altered throughout the season as the crop grows targeting specific pests and diseases or avoiding areas where beneficials are known to colonize. But this kind of thing is, is cheap and easy to do for the growers, but they need the information and the tools to check the spray machine's deposition. So looking to what is being developed now and should be available in the near future, or in many cases or is already available, how can we improve the efficacy of crop protection products? The technology exists to measure the entire canopy structure of a crop, quantifying canopy density, gaps, plant dimensions. We can measure and map pests and diseases. Applying products heterogeneously across the crop area using a variable rate spray machine rather than blanket spray the whole area with a fixed dose. And in the near future, we may also have autonomous spray machines working slowly, closely to the crop and very precisely. At, at uh, NIA BMR, we're involved in a project to develop a precision spray machine for orchards. So here I'm going to go through various components and aspects that uh, to consider. So firstly, the system will involve a range of data streams, and these must all be geo-referenced with high precision. The geo-referencing is the link between the data, so therefore RTK GPS or some other precise mapping method is an essential component of any precision spray system. The crop must be surveyed by one or more means. For example, we could use LIDAR, which measures the canopy structure, or cameras mounted onto the ground or aerial vehicles we can record RGB or other spectral data, and we can include things like satellite images to provide larger scale data. The data must then be processed. Training the machine vision systems and developing the algorithms for systems to manage all this data is no mean feat. The more data streams that are included, the more complex the system becomes. The processing of the data can be done in real time as it's collected in the field. 
with immediate dose adjustment occurring. And these types of systems have been around a long time and can adjust spray output based on things like canopy density, essentially turning off nozzles where there are no trees to spray. But if we process the data separately from the surveying, it opens up more potential for higher precision systems that utilize a wider range of data sources, for example, including things like ground heights, meteorological or environmental data, even manual data such as yield values from the last year. It could be including spectral data and spore trap data to provide improved uh, pest and disease identification. So next, uh, we move into the dose adjustment. So the output of the data processing are values that we can use to calculate an adjustment to the dose of the control agent being applied. And the most basic dose adjustment may simply be turning nozzles off in the absence of the, cro of the crop, i.e. don't spray the gaps. Um, and this has been around for quite a long time. But true precision crop protection utilizes a combination of data types, each providing information that results in a dose map with an individual dose for each spatially relevant unit. So it might be per tree in an orchard, it might be per square, square meter in a potato crop, or it may be individual plants in a strawberry crop. And of course, all of this must be precisely geo-referenced. So the dose adjustments may be two-dimensional for smaller crops, but for larger crops, such as trees with complex canopies, we may need to have a three-dimensional dose adjustment and to develop the dose adjustments, more information is required on the effective dose rates per canopy area. And ideally, we want to include information on the pest and the pathogen, for example, from population modeling for predicting the risk factor of that particular pest or disease, or spore trap data to check inoculum levels. So finally, a variable rate spray machine allows spray nozzle output to be controlled. Unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as we might hope to control nozzle output. Conventional nozzles require a specific liquid pressure to produce the correct droplet spectra from very fine to, to coarse droplets. So we cannot vary the flow output of the nozzle by varying in pressure because it will change the droplet spectra. So one solution is to have banks of nozzles that can be linked together and then just switched on or off to vary the total output. This is relatively cheap, but lacks precision and has its own mechanical complications. A better method is to use pulse width modulation nozzles, PWMs. And these nozzles contain a solenoid actuator with a control chip and can vary their output depending on the duty cycle from naught to 100. So while these are more expensive, they offer much greater control and precision. So moving on then to the last section. So to address the initial questions for this conference, these are some of my thoughts on the barriers to adoption of the techniques I've talked about today. Firstly, of course, financial. Variable rate spray systems using PWM nozzles have been on the market for more than 20 years, yet the uptake is still quite low, particularly in the UK horticultural sector. I think this is probably mostly due to the cost of the systems. So as I said, we're at NIA BMR involved in an R&D project to develop a variable rate spray system for apple orchards and the PWM nozzles and the control system will likely cost in excess of £20,000 and that's before adding in the other components required like the RTK GPS receivers and other hardware and software. So that's, it. that's a, a large increase on the cost of a horticultural spray machine. Then we've got risk. So most of the growers I've met are pretty risk adverse, especially when it comes to protecting their yields. Growers need to be completely confident and perhaps require incentives to apply less pesticide than they are allowed to. And of course, we've got technical barriers. The challenge of how to get spray to the parts of the plant where it is actually needed, I think are yet to be completely met. There are certainly things that growers can do which improve their spray deposition, but ultimately I think we need new methods of spraying, perhaps using smaller automated machines that can apply spray closer to the crop with greater precision, and hopefully getting the spray to where it is most effective.
So to improve the spray deposition now and get the most out of the products being applied, pesticide labels could have clearer information or more information. Guidance on what is good spray coverage but for a specific product and target pest, perhaps even going as far as to give the minimum quantity of active ingredient required per crop area surface to achieve control. And then looking forward, there will be challenges to overcome in terms of regulations around the safety for application of pesticides by autonomous vehicles, the advent of which is really not very far away. Pesticides are hazardous, so the risks of autonomous application need to be considered. Finally, if growers are adjusting the dose of the pesticides being applied to their crop, are there implications for this? Is there a risk of increased pesticide resistance if applications are incorrect? So we can avoid breaching maximum residue limits by ensuring that the maximum dose doesn't go above the existing levels, but perhaps this would need to be revised if pesticides are being applied more precisely. So final thought, new technologies and precision spray systems are becoming more available and will be more adopted by growers, I'm sure. However, in the meantime, I think there is still a lot we and growers can do to get the most out of the existing equipment and ultimately reduce the amount of pesticide applications. So all that remains to say is thank you very much for listening. I hope there's been some useful information in there. And just to thank all the partners and the funders that we've worked with over the years, particularly for the two projects that I've uh, talked about in today's presentation. Thank you very much.